Where are we? What's the year? <laughs> Someone tell me the year real quick. Oh my God. Is it 2044? Welcome to the future, man. Welcome to the future. It's 2023 we're and we're back. 2023, there's been another disturbance in the time continuum. Oh my God. It is, <laughs> there's definitely a lot of disturbance going on. Yeah, that means more Mandela effects, I'm afraid. More <laughs> Mandela. Oh my gosh. <laughs> There's so, always, always something, right? Yeah. So we're here on Women of the Stars. We got um, Jonathan Bailey. Hello, hello. Terry. Hi, everybody. Liz, and the wonderful. Uh, who are you today? I'm Dr. Emmett Brown. Okay. So we got Dr. Brown, aka Chris Sinatra, one of my favorite, favorite people to talk to. I love your heart for even busting out. This is Back to the Future gig for me. Yeah, I've got my, my Star Trek shirt on with the Enterprise. So I am definitely in the future mode for sure. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> my gosh. So since you started with some anomalies, I don't know. First, first off, you guys, you and Sean, you got together and you're doing interviews on your channel now. You're you're doing more work on your channel. What's the name of your channel and what, what are you guys really focused on this year? Yeah, so <laughs> the name of the channel is Quantum Businessman. Right. I have a website, quantumbusinessman.com, where I've like cataloged a lot of the videos that I've created and put together. And we're going through and we're interviewing people from all different areas. So when you watch the interviews, they'll be like, why they interview this person? Why they interview that person? And what's the consistency? And it's, it may not be easy to see the consistency, but there is one. And we actually just interviewed someone. His name is Lynn Buchanan. And George Clooney played him in the movie, The Man Who Stared at Go Goats. So he worked for the government. Um, oh, wow. As remote viewing. And it was a really, really cool interview. So hopefully in the next day or two, we'll be posting that and um, getting his insight about the whole world of remote viewing and how that works. You know, is it real? You know, why does the government sometimes deny it, but they let out information to let, you know, the public know that there might be something to it. So, yeah, so it's, uh, it's all really cool. All these different people have different aspects of revealing what the reality is. Mm -hmm. They've been working on that since, since at least the 60s, right? Like remote viewing? Oh yeah, who knows how far back that goes? But he was yeah. he was involved, I think, in the late '80s and into the I think 1995 is when he left the military. Oh, was there any LSD involved in that? I think, I'm sure, I'm sure it was. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, one of my favorite shows is um, Jeepers. I'll think of it. You guys know what I'm talking about? It's it's the show they show all the experiments. X Files? No, no. Megan Markell was in it. Megan Markell. Well, anyway, can you? So you were talking about Fringe. That's it. Oh, Fringe. Who does not freaking love Fringe? Because it seems like fringe. they went oh, through every scientific experiment there was. I tried to watch it a third time, and I got scared. <laughs> 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 I'm like, you know, I don't know, my, my men, I have changed a little bit. Like I've gotten a little bit soft. Like I used to watch American Horror Stories and stuff. Now I'm like, ooh, kind of cringe when I watch it. So what, what's your favorite part of um, Fringe? <laughs> yeah, just like all these things that they brought to light about like things that the global narrative would totally deny. And yeah, I, I can't remember any specific themes of any shows, but it was like all really cool stuff. Yeah. yeah. I, I know I watched every episode. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, there were people under the ground, the body parts that were automated body parts that were attacking people. And then um, had the multiverse. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So much about the multiverse. Between yeah. Them. Going to get his son from the other side. Right. Yeah, doing surgery from his own head. So he couldn't remember all the information in that one year. yeah and the watchers oh yeah yeah Ooh, the watchers that guy who wants the extra jalapenos and spice 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 yeah <laughs> i love yeah like i guess he needed all that spice i don't know i wanted to just that. call him milk 
because <laughs> he was he was pale like milk. So any new uh, any new time anomalies that you wanted to tell us about? Um, you know, us with it. Yeah, it's, it seems like there's always like strange things in the reality that I've never witnessed before. Uh, one of the things was is I recently saw a picture from Antarctica of an iceberg that was completely rectangular. And I had never seen like such perfect 90 degree angles on a on an iceberg before, which was it was it was a, a NASA photograph. So it was from the global narrative. So and then I've seen and some of you guys may have seen this, too, like people are zooming in to the sky with their cameras. And sometimes the more they zoom in, it starts to look like a circuit board. Yeah, like, so I've seen that. Yeah, like so, there's a digital print outside of it. I didn't know what to think about that. Yeah, so that's interesting because the global narrative tells us, oh, you've just discovered how a megapixel camera works. When you zoom, zoom in on something, you see all the square pixels. But when you look at the picture, it looks more like a circuit board. And why does it only work in the sky? How come it doesn't work for something inside? So definitely some questions involved in that. Like, could the matrix be breaking down? Well, there you know is what, that. what that makes me think, though, is when, when I went to the pyramids, I could only see the orbs with, when it was, not even on just taking a picture, I could only see it when it was on video. Yeah, that makes sense. Because the, the camera is picking up the light that your eyes can't see yet, your eyes will be able to see it. I know sometimes when my third eye is opened and I look at the clouds, the cl they're not clouds, they're just like geometric symbols floating in the sky. Uh, yeah, so it's it's really interesting how all this works. So I, I was kind of bugging out because I went to Egypt and I came back and I wanted to send some stuff to Terry and Jonathan and I got real pissed off because I tried to ship the items and I shipped it and they had to pay $100 to pick it up. And I was like, Chris, how do we function? Like, like people think that we're free and we're living in this free society and they have this perception of freedom. And I was like, if you really want to see that we're not free, try to travel to another country. I know. I know. No, were those fees like what they call like import tariff fees or? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's that's really too bad when they do that. And UPS clearance fees and all that, you know, all that stuff. Did you send it from Egypt? No, I sent it from the U.S. They're in Canada, though. They're in Canada and I'm in the U.S. I mean, I mean, that there are neighbor to the north. Like there shouldn't be issues with that. Right. I, I think I, know. I declared it as 200 and they said, well, let just give me 115 and 106. Like I declared a value of like 200 and basically the what half of the value of the item, that's what they wanted to charge. Yeah. And even the whole concept where you currently, un unless you're, you can't enter the US. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's only two countries in the world left like that. The United States and North Korea. And who wants to go to North Korea? North Korea. Oh, I thought you were going to say North Corona. <laughs> With a lime. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because we went to Egypt, no problem. That was like no yeah. problem. I was so happy. Actually, I was scared to go to Canada. I don't know. I'm just afraid of Trudeau. I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> I, I don't know. He scares me. Yeah. <laughs> I thought they were going to try to keep me in Canada. <laughs> I did. Somebody oh. mailed him a foot. Did you guys hear about that? An actual foot? A foot. Hmm. This guy was like a serial killer and he mailed him a foot. And I'm just shocked that nobody heard, heard about it. No. Yeah. It was a couple, few years ago, about two years ago. They, they have this movie out called Don't Fuck With Cats. And the guy was doing things to cats and people were watching him on YouTube do these things. And they followed up on him and he killed a person and then he mailed Trudeau a foot. The, the agony of defeat. <laughs> the agony of defeat. Yeah. Ew. Yeah. It was horrible. It was really creepy, but I, I don't know if you can stand it, you can watch it. But I, I made it through it because I just, you know, when you watch something horrible and you just can't stop. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it was that thing. So you're the quantum... <laughs> 
quantum businessman. So one day we were just talking about the fact that I don't know. Are you are you fin- are you like a graduate school person? Like, did you graduate from college? No, I did. I did. I'm a dropout. Um, college dropout all the way to start my own business because I, I felt I wasn't learning enough. Like I wanted to kn- know computer software at that time, and they weren't the courses like were old software stuff that no one was using. Like people were using, but it wasn't the future. So I I wound up dropping out. This was the thing we were talking about. How we could how come we couldn't go and jump through all the hoops and 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 participate in the circus and just graduate like most people, just to have jobs. But here you are. I noticed um I was in ethics class and we were talking about morals and ethics. And the fact was they said this is what the right thing is to do, but if your job does tells you to do this, then just do what they told you to do. And I like packed up my stuff and walked out of class. I was like, this is crazy. Yeah. And so they were already tra- te- teaching us that mindset. And I thought, wow. So I just saw the hypocrisy and the weirdness that I was learning in school. And I, you know, of course you're in like a liberal arts and business. It, it was just crazy. So why I was trying to figure out the mindset of us, why, why we couldn't pass. <laughs> Why we couldn't jump through the hoops? Well, I know part of my issue too had to do with, um, as I've mentioned before, the religion that we were in, I was in, I would have like elders meetings, like, you know, Brother Anatra, we understand you're going to higher education. The world will be ending any day. Why are you seeking a career in something that's going to be over soon? So I had on the other side too, I had that pressure. So, but I love to be, I loved how software can make me creative and I could create things and have it for business applications. And then I had the religious thing, like pulling me in one direction, like, no, that's not what you should be doing, focusing on this instead. So I had a lot of different pressures back and forth. I'm glad you said that because that means I'm not crazy because one day the, the th- there was lightning and thunder and the thunder hit so loud. I jumped out of the bed. I said, oh God. <laughs> I thought Jesus was back like right now. I thought it was all over. And when I tell people the mentality of like, I was just so grateful to make it to 18 that all I wanted to do was like try to get married and have a baby real fast. Cause we all, I felt like we were going to die like any minute yeah. and they're not really understanding that because of our church upbringings, we were told like, it's coming to an end, he's coming back. And so how do you begin to be a, a, a young person planning for the future when you're constantly being taught that the world is gonna end? Exactly, exactly. That was in the eighties for me, that was back in the eighties. So the world kept going, here we are, me wearing a Emmett Brown costume talking to you about business. <laughs> but it's kind of like the the thing that's kind of going on right now with, with uh, with not just truthers, but with our awakened brothers and sisters that they're kind of like waiting for the money system to fail and they're waiting for the aliens to come and they're kind of waiting. And I, I was, I brought this up before that in 1918, people thought the world was gonna end, right? In 1999, Y2K, they thought the world was gonna end. And we, I just think it's so dangerous how everybody just gets to waiting instead of living. Right, good point. Live, live in the now, like that Van Halen song, right now, it's everything. Mm-hmm. And it's true. Oh, wow. Now is, now is everything. Yeah. I don't know, did you all have anything to say about that? Because Jonathan, you also grew up as a J-Dub. That's what we call a J-Dub, <laughs> like J-Dub. <laughs> um, yeah, because it, the little birdie on the wall, you know, on the shoulder, telling you, you know, we, we should be more hyper-focused in this and you know, and see, I had a lot of um, other distractions because my mom was sick. So there was a misdirection of, of focus. So I didn't really get that as, as you did. Um, I had, I kind of had like a, a shield of, a shield of sorts because everybody would always go towards um, trying to assist my mom and stuff and my dad and and just find that balance with with that so i i kind of kind of snuck out there and got into uh, sports and stuff like that and then it was like oh this is i mean 
they're saying we're gonna die anyways or it's gonna all shit all it. I'm, not, I'm gonna i'm gonna do it I'm, i feel this is the way i need to go so i mean i was in a in that spiral of of a time so that chaotic year years going ahead of finding alcohol and everything right so um yeah it was that's the justification to take the juice is to we're all gonna die anyway yeah we're all gonna die anyway and the yes, thing here always, we are the thing that <laughs> here we got are. me though is that is the I, I i never could swallow the pill of how they would just cut people off you know oh for, you know, discommunicating and oh, yeah. what do you call it um, this fellowship this, this fellowship uh, and disassociation yeah dissociation yeah. yeah how did you how did you break from that though chris if 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 they were telling you technology you know and here you go too like i didn't want an iphone because i was like oh they're gonna meet my retina this is the devil this is the devil's phone <laughs> like like how do you keep moving with technology because i think we do that too like even with AI photos, people are scared of AI photos because they think you're selling your soul to the AI because you got Photoshop. <laughs> really, all AI photos are is just like Photoshop pre presets. And now we're all going to hell from AI and technology and everything's burning. And I heard one lady say even fake fingernails, you got a tattoo, you're going to get black goo. It, uh, just everything is going to kill you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's the kind of thing they say. But when I when I when I look at AI, I see like everything else. I see three different types of AI: ah. positive, negative, and neutral. So the negative kind is like you know Terminator, you know, extinction of mankind. That's not the kind we want. Borg. And what's that? The Borg. Borg. Yeah. Yeah, like in Star Trek. Like in Star Trek. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the board like that kind of a concept where you get taken over and be part of like a hive mind type thing and then there's neutral which is you know neutral is neutral and then there's positive which wants to actually help humanity and help the planet and solve problems like pollution and you know whatever the whatever the problem is work on solutions that work hand in hand with humanity so if there is that type of ai that's positive i would say it's a tool to, to help us. And we should try to everything we can to reject the other kind, especially the negative kind. And the neutral yes. thing is, is probably just learning if it wants to be negative or neutral. Wow. So how do you feel about Elon Musk? Because some people say, oh, he's Elon is great. And I'm like, well, his mom was a witch. And they're, you know, and so <laughs> there, there's this thing of, you know. I don't know if I, I, I don't want to be a part of that, uh, the grid and uh, what, what is that? Starlink, the uh, thing, Neuralink. The ship, Neuralink inside the brain with, I mean, I can see what he's saying. Like if my arm is dead, if I have Neuralink, it can reconnect the nerves and allow me to use this arm, like kind of overriding the damage. Or if you get into a car accident and you're paralyzed, it could, you know, allow you to walk again. You know, the, that's positive, right? So, you know, sometimes and sometimes even with with Elon, if it's, he almost like like he goes into positive territory and then maybe something pushes him back. So he seems like he kind of fluctuates. So I'm not sure what version of Elon we have, but lately it seems like he's been doing positive things. So. Do you do you believe we still like we actually made it to outer space? like on our own steam with the with the challenger and all that oh so so yeah so that's a that's a whole topic and <laughs> but it, it is because what is outer space like i i say it's everything we see is like a hologram everything is holographic it's a holographic projection but why does it seem so hard to get into outer space like you need these big rocket engines if you don't have these big rockets like you're confined and then there's talk about things like the secret space program you know, how does that tie into it? You know, have did, did the Germans figure out a way to leave and other types of uh, the space force that the United States government is involved with? Are, are Have they been able to secretly leave the confines of Earth? Do you need a rocket engine to leave? Like what is out there? And yes, yeah, so that's a whole that's a whole other subject, but it goes 
it goes deep as far as what it appears to be for me right now anyways that the global narrative makes it appear that it's hard to get into outer space and then what is outer what is outer space so yeah and, and is there I, like i believe everything is consciousness everything is consciousness energy like when we look up at the stars what are we really seeing um is it the actual stars and planets is it is it a projection of what they would be what's the james webb telescope those beautiful things it's sending back like what you know what's that all about so those, i struggle those, with james webb telescope say that again i struggle with the james webb telescope because i'm I, i'm like if you can get that close to jupiter i don't know i'm, I'm just thinking there's a lot of stuff other stuff that's missing out of the picture exactly exactly if, if i can see all the way there we'll <laughs> exactly something has to be floating between me and jupiter so tell me what else is in between that, that we're not showing in the picture exactly so it, it's hard you, it's yeah. like you don't have enough information to make like a really good answer but we have like lots of clues floating around us but we don't really have the right answers like why can't we see a little speck of dust on the moon you know that that should be easy to do right i yeah. should be able to track down those footprints yeah, if I can exactly. see Jupiter, why can't I see those footprints and that flag and that stuff? Exactly. Those are all good questions. And why haven't we really been back to the moon? You know, did we make it the first time? Why haven't we been back? So there's there's so many, there's so many questions. But but the problem is, is that people don't ask questions anymore. And if they do ask questions, they're pushed aside or you're labeled as a theor conspiracy theorists but yeah. all you want to know is this doesn't make sense can you explain it can somebody explain it but there's a narrative that maybe the matrix wants to have a certain narrative and it has uh, to, it has yeah. to. I'm thinking control. this is why we never made it through school like properly I don't know did did you graduate Jonathan uh, college college no yeah. Terry yeah I did. <laughs> Not an associate. I went back. Uh, I went back a few times. I got like some certifications and some things, but I just, I just know the first time I just couldn't make it through because I was too busy looking to the left and looking to the right and thinking this isn't right. This isn't fair. This isn't. And I, I was just, I just couldn't do it. But my first, well, my first class in history, the professor said, "Do you believe everything that you read in history books?" And it that, you know, I'm 18 years old, it changed my life because I started to question it. And then he said, do you believe everything you see on TV? I don't think they do that anymore. That was <laughs> a few decades ago, but it, it influenced my life because it made me question. And that's, and he, you know, he said that it's like, question everything. And it's like, I wish, I wish that was the way that people were taught now, but he was um, very, uh, that was a very profound instruction. Yeah, it was. And you should have everything. I had an a, a elementary school teacher teach us about propaganda. And she taught us about bandwagon and testimonial and you know, like nine out of 10 dentists. She taught us about yellow dog journalism. Isn't it? That's what it's called, right? Like when the, the media overstates and like, how you know, they, they overstate an idea or opinion and they like bash people. And, and I'm, I'm asking people and no one ever learned these words when they were in school, especially elementary school. So I, I think there's certain people planted <laughs> for us to find them <laughs> and and like not even probably could find a classmate of mine that could repeat any of the stuff that I learned like where was I I was maybe not in the same classroom yeah yes exactly. yeah and then who's you know who's behind it like it's our own government that's behind it like the CIA and and every three-letter initial you know government agency it's all behind like the propaganda and changing our trying attempting to change our minds and steer our consciousness into the direction that they want is that would you call that social engineering is that what that yeah uh social engineering they're creating mass psychosis mass psychosis begin with with fear and then once you have a mass psychosis event you can start to like motivate people to do things in a certain way that 
before it would have been insane, but now it's it's it makes sense because of how they've steered, you know, whatever whatever the situation is to go in the way that they want. Oh, so, yeah, that that's that hasn't happened recently, has it? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, when I was going to the airport, I was thinking, you know, hey, perfect reason for us to have a 9-11 so that we can go through the airport and and justify all these things that I'm going to do to you at the airport. That's exactly. what I was thinking when I was in there. Exactly. And then I had to remember, yeah, I had to remember like, oh, this is this is how we got away with that, right? And and you know, we had to put some ricin out there and and, and <laughs> have little envelopes with powder so that right. we could say this is for your own good. Right. Meanwhile, this guy is unwrapping all my stuff and 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 breaking my collectibles. <laughs> As I'm going through customs, I was like so heated. So there's this book called Terry, you know it, Who Stole My Cheese? Or Who Moved the Cheese? Or Who Moved the Cheese? I think so. Or who's, yeah, yeah I can't who, remember. Moved, who Moved the Cheese? Yeah. Who Moved the Cheese? Was that is that something you're familiar with, Chris? Or um, I've heard about, I haven't read the book, but I've heard about the concept of you know, what is, what is the cheese? Like, what is the, what we're look, seeking for in our life? And then how come that we think we know where the cheese is? Like, we're, like we're rats in a maze and, you know, we start off here and then we know the cheese is down here. So we have to navigate to get to, get to the cheese and then we get to it. It's not there. Um, you know, so th that type of a concept. I think a lot of people kind of live their, how their lives, thinking like, I'm going to get married. I'm going to have a big house. I'm going to get this wonderful job. And they think this is the cheese. And it's just this trying to go through life. And then when you don't find the happiness that you thought you were going to find by going through this, this, you know, this hypothetical maze that people said, this is what you have to do to find happiness and joy. I'm, and I'm, I'm, and it's, I'm really seeing it too with this patriarchal I'm not a feminist, but it's just the idea that uh, people think that they can, one person can dominate the other. Right. And they think that they're going to have this happy life. And then you realize, you know what? I did get married and I did get a job and I still can't afford to take care of my family. And my wife resents me exactly. because you're trying to, you think that you can make children happy and you think you can make a wife happy when everybody has to be responsible for their own happiness. Right. Like, right. I'm I'm just observing in different cultures how people the different things that people think will make them happy and when they go for it none of it is making them happy. Yeah, and even when people obtain success, it's usually they do it through three things: sacrifice. They have to sacrifice all these things. Can't spend time with their their family. Have to sacrifice this. Have to can't buy this. You know, got to save, save, save. The other part of it is um, is lack. Like they they would consist you know ex exist in lack where they there would be a, a certain amount of time where they just couldn't have what they want and then the other part of it is is control so sometimes for, for people to become successful either they get controlled but usually they attempt to control others and then when they obtain the success like a lot of these people that are like millionaires or billionaires I don't know how many of them are really happy like like seriously. Does a number of zeros in your bank account like equate to happiness if you're not getting along with your kids and your wife and this and that and you've got this like so like what's what is the cheese what is what is this all about like what's and if in what's the white the right correct way to get to the cheese and then mm -hmm. you know what's the right way to to live your life and have true abundance because abundant health and abundance are like and love with the people around us are like some of the biggest happiness joy qualities we can obtain in this life i think the most difficult thing about it is that somebody drew lines in the sand because if i could live by the beach and eat fish out of the ocean and fruit off the trees and enjoy the beauty of the land and the beach i would be happy but if you live in fiji they said get your ass off the beach because <laughs> i got a resort and you gotta have to pay to come to, <laughs> to the beach I, I, I was watching a show and I was just thinking about how people pay so much money to go to these beautiful places where somebody else used to live there and they used to live there for free. 
Right. And they used to be able to enjoy that for free, but until someone drew a line in the sand and told them that this is mine. And it kind of makes makes it harder because somebody moved my cheese. Yeah. <laughs> they did move my yeah. cheese because my cheese was right here on the beach. Yeah, they stole your cheese. They stole my freaking cheese. So I don't know if you ever heard of any of those experiments, like the Stanford experiment or anything like that. Was that the the one where they tried to figure out like why a lot of the Germans like were okay with like what Hitler was doing? I think it, it is it is a part of that. That and third wave. In third wave, they did it in a high school. Okay. And in Sta- the Stanford experiment, they made they they paid some guys five dollars a week or something like that to pretend they were prisoners and oh, prison okay. guards. Yeah, and they would zap them. Yeah, and they watched the behavior change just based on their job and based on their title. With the third wave, it was based on the grades because people were so eager to get the grades. Oh, okay. And so this is what I was seeing, how we didn't really care about the grades. Somehow the grades weren't enough for me to jump through the hoops. Like the pat on the back wasn't enough to jump through the hoop if I saw injustice in some way. Where I noticed people can go through school and and they can watch other people fail or they'll get involved in bullying or they'll join fraternities and sororities where there's, there's always something where it's like, if I can be a part of this group, I don't really care how you feel or how you're treated as long as I get what I want out of it. And we were just having this conversation about, <laughs> about like, why, why is it that we look to the left and look to the right? Why are we, looking around us and but we can't jump through the hoops like other people do but it seems like you're that person too I mean what did you feel like what do you I mean besides that you saw that you wanted to be a part with the technology and that you were being you know told religion religion wise that this isn't the place to be what do you feel like stopped you from just pursuing this corporate life or being good what to do yeah, it just, for me, it was just something inside of me that I never really wanted to work for anyone else. I always wanted to like do my own thing. So, and like use my own creativity because like, even when I was in high school, I was doing, I was actually writing software for people on the side. There was a couple, um. of, a couple of businesses in the town that would hire me to like write software for them. And um, it was okay. I enjoyed doing it, but I always wanted to do my own thing and the whole entrepreneurial spirit. So even like, so my last name is Anatra. So like my father says, you know, we're entrepreneurs. Oh, Not wow. <laughs> entrepreneur, but we're an entrepreneur. So it was just one of those things that always really motivated me that to just do something on my own and kind of set my own life course. Yeah, so for me, it was just, just a natural thing. In, in, in eight, it was just in there. It was just in there. So, yeah. so uh, when you were growing up, <clears throat> we're just talking about your father, was he sort of like, did he encourage you to go in that direction? Or was it more of you're bucking the system? How, how was, how did that influence you? Yeah, because I think that even at that time, he could start to see that there's something that wasn't right in that religion. So Yes. So he actually paid for like one of my semesters going to college. Like you should at least go and explore the idea. My younger brother wound up going for four years. Like he's a, he became a CPA. So yeah. So I feel, I feel like I always had that encouragement that there is a few, like there could be a few, even though he was an elder, right. There could be a future, you know, outside of what this religion says. And even though they're saying like any, like any day now it's going to end, you know, back in whatever, 1982, there could actually be a future and you should <laughs> plan for the future. So yeah, live in the now, but, you know, have thoughts about how you want to shape your future. Daydream about it, literally, because they're dreaming right now. So why not day, daydream about your future and what you'd want it to be? And that's, that's what it can become easier for us. Because with all these new energies coming onto the planet, like it's at the sun, like I was looking at my, I get these text messages every time there's a solar flare, 
we, we had, I think, three solar flare, flares in the last 18 hours. One, I think an M, uh, M5 class flare, which is almost an, another X, we had a big X class flare last week. So that, that's just part of the equation of what's going on. But things are definitely changing here where I think that we're going to be, we're all like our frequencies are just naturally rising. And what we want to manifest is going to become easier and easier. But the key to begin manifesting besides raising your frequency, and when you see Mandela effects, that's a clue that your frequency is rising because you're not in the old timeline, you're in a new timeline, that to start dreaming about what you want, just think about it, write it down and be start to become like, let the let the wonder of the future come in and start to see things start to take shape. Like, I really think we're, we're getting to that level where we're going to be able to manifest things so much easier. This is so good to hear. Because I like this. I, I think I've moved away from predictions, uh, especially anything negative, uh, because I, I just can't absorb it anymore. I, I think because if, if I'm at the point where I'm absorbing negative predictions, then it will be negative for me. Right. My timeline will be negative. And so exactly. I have to just focus on these things that are positive. And I, I just I'm really hesitant about talking too much to anybody who has anything to say about <laughs> any kind of blast or any type of, I don't know, anything waiting, waiting, waiting for a savior of any sort. It's just way too difficult for me. I can't hear it. Yeah. It doesn't resonate. Yeah. I don't know about you, you guys. I, I just, so that's why you're here. So we can go back to the future together. <laughs> I want you to tell me about the future. So when, what do you see going on the horizon when it comes to like the financial system? Because I see people uh, trying to say that we need to get rid of the money system. I still have a thought that no matter what, if, there, if there's not money, there's always some type of exchange. Some kind of commerce. Yeah. There's, and what are your thoughts on that? Because there's a corruption that's in a person, regardless of money or no money. Would I would like for you to speak on that. Sure. Um, so yeah, so there's there's a lot that I can say about like the our current monetary system, you know, whether it's the US dollar or whatever currency it is. Talking about the US dollar, I think that it's I, I don't know, like we're still using it as a method of exchange, but to me, our country is like we're so in debt, like it's it doesn't like we're literally monopoly money has more value than the US dollar, because there's far less monopoly money that was printed with the monopoly game. So if you look at it, dollar, the, the, each monopoly bill would be worth, I don't know, $100,000. So there's the whole, there's that whole concept of the monetary system and what is going to happen to it, right? So will things like cryptocurrencies and the blockchain concept take over, you know? So that's one way to look at it. Or you know, is something going to happen with these CBDs, the central bank digital currencies that they're trying to put into place? And I think most people, um, most people that understand what that's about are going to reject it right away because it's literally programmable money. And so if if the government can program the money, like this is your money mm -hmm. after five years, um, it expires, or you're only allowed to buy blah, blah, blah. You had a posting on Facebook we didn't like. So instead of buying this car, you're only allowed to buy this car or whatever whatever rules they set up to control. It's like another level of control. And who wants to be controlled? Like nobody wants to be controlled. So I don't think that's true. I think some people do want to be controlled because I guess like when they fear things, they they want to put control on other people. So easily people vote to be controlled. Yeah, well, that, that is Folk to be controlled all the time. Yeah, some people like to be told what to do. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. But there, there's enough of us that are free thinkers that can understand the consequences. And, you know, you know, there's the whole concept of I've talked to spoken about this before. Like, what is Earth? Are we dreaming? What are player characters versus non player characters? Who's going along with the global narrative more easily? You know, who really has control? If all the player characters wake up 
and our conscious we're the ones that actually have all this consciousness energy can we shape the future of how things are going to go or are we going to be pulled like they're trying to pull us like 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 a tide going out like to go with the flow of the fear and oh we need government's going to save us and this is the only way you can do business in this new digital world like I believe that, that that there'll be enough people waking up to seek alternatives, you know, and, and what could those alternatives be? Could it be crypto, you know, and the, with the blockchain involved, which I think is a very real possibility. Some people look at things another way where they, they feel like the sun is going to supernova and bring us back into the stone ages. And if you ever see that like Mad Max show people become like Mad Max and, you know, fighting over whatever resources are left. So some people like look to that kind of a future, you know, but are, are we going to go to another higher timeline future with like free energy and um, flying cars and airships and all of this technology that we've, that has like, we've already created this in the past, like with the Tartarian empire and Atlantis and, other civilizations of the past we've already created this technology it's like already there so what's you know what is the future going to hold and a lot of it depends on what we dream about as far as the future goes i've been dreaming a lot about airships in the future of moving cargo and the food supply chain and not being landlocked anymore because right now you got to have these huge big tankers that have all these cargo containers on them and the amount of fuel and pollution that they cause is like it's it's insane but then you talk about the concept of airships which are almost zero emission um you know that have that are filled with helium or hydrogen and can go to places and land and and move things qu actually more quickly um and if there is an environmental disaster they can go there and assist like if there's no if the road structure is gone these airships have all these capabilities that, you know, a jet aircraft doesn't have because it needs a landing strip or whatever. So for myself, I've been dreaming about that kind of a future. And I believe that in the past, like that was already here on the planet. But at the very least, the Tartarians had that technology at the very least. So, yeah, what does our future, what does our future hold? And I think that there's different timelines, right? There's ooh, the one that's going down and the one that's going to be going up to higher frequencies. It's interesting that you're saying about the airships because um, where we are in Canada, they have to have uh, winter roads to bring up supplies to the to the northern communities because there's no roads. And so they depend on ice roads and that sort of thing. And I know that i've I've heard information, you know they they've talked about the airships being part of, you know, being able to take up the supplies. But it just seems that, you know they'll talk about it and then it's kind of like laughed at but it's it's more relevant than than um than you know exactly. trucks making that trip over the ice roads exactly it's it, it would be when 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 airships come out i'm just going to say not if but but when they start being constructed and actually used for this purpose that's disruption of the current system like they call these things black swan events because like there was a certain time where the world never knew that a black swan existed. They always thought they were white. And then I don't know, 500 years ago, so they discovered in Australia, there's something called black swans and people couldn't believe it. Like there's no such thing as a black swan. So I believe that air, airships are just one of these types of things that are going to dramatically change. And especially Canada going up to those remote Northern, you know, places where they don't, they can't get fresh food. It's, nope. They can't. So airships are the perfect solution. And you can get an airship from like Toronto to way up north in a matter of hours. It's not days or anything. And they fly better when it's cold. They're more buoyant the colder the air is. So yeah, wow. yeah. so there's all, all kinds of cool stuff, I think, on the horizon for that. Yeah. As yeah, you and, and it, the that. technology is there. It's just that it's not being pushed by the scenario. Right. As you were descri describing it all, I had the, the the crystallization flood up the spine and down the spine and all around. So it's oh cool. Mm. Your your cranial sacral fluid got got activated there. Mm -hmm. as, awesome. as there as you were just as you were talking about enough people being aware and being mindful of creating, and it just 
Well, then, yeah, that's definitely something people need to talk more about. I never heard of it. I never heard of or thought of it. So, yeah. man, that, that's mind-blowing. And I think that's why it's so important we keep sharing information like this because, I don't know, it's, it's, there's certain minds that need to be heard. And so, and, and, wow. And going back to it, the, yeah. the airships were being used in the... 20s and 30s and then all of a sudden the Hindenburg oh, and that was it right that was and the excuse yeah. right the excuse that was the excuse and yet, yeah and yet if you think about it um people were able to you know like people were able to get off of those things and stuff you get a jet plane it goes down and it whoop, that's it exactly exactly and the Hindenburg had something like there there were 60 successful flights the Hindenburg was going from uh, Berlin to South America to Manhattan. It was making all these trips all over the place, and people loved it. It was literally a flying five-star hotel. It had a cigar bar, and you know everyone had their own suite, and it was quiet, and the scenery was amazing. Have you guys ever heard what I've talked about related to the Hindenburg and time travelers? No. Okay, so I'll I'll just describe this this briefly, but basically. Um, World War II, the Nazis, you know, let's, let's say the United States won World War II. There's a debate about who actually won the war, but um, in all the timelines where the Germans successfully won the, the war, the Hindenburg never went down because the Hindenburg and these airships were, were bringing great prominence to Germany. People loved them. And Germany and the Zeppelins, were they were building this fleet of airships. But when the Hindenburg went down, all of a sudden, no one wants to have anything to do with an airship anymore. And then when you look into the Akashic records, you see what happened that time travelers were involved because of something called St. Elmo's Fire. So St. Elmo's Fire is a, is a very unique electrical discharge that happens only at certain, certain times. And what they say in the Akashic Records or what's revealed there is that even ship captains back in the day, if St. Elmo's fire hit the mast of your ship, you could move your ship through time. You could actually travel through time or travel from ocean to ocean to escape. Let's say you're a pirates and you're being chased. If you had people on the crew that had the ability to, to influence the weather and, and call in St. Elmo's fire and hit the mast of the ship, and other people that knew how, you know, their higher self knew how these coordinates worked, you could actually transport your ship out of an emergency situation. So St. Elmo's fire is like a blue, it's like a blue lightning. That's always in, like the key is whenever you hear about it, there's usually some kind of time travel involved. So the time travelers knew that every time that, that hint, like when the Hindenburg went down, that ended the Germans' prominence. So and then that leads to a Mandela effect because a lot of people remember, and I don't, I'll just ask you guys a question, there's no wrong answer, about the survivors of the Hindenburg. Like, what do you guys know about like the survivors? Or were there any survivors? I should ask that ask it that way. And if you don't know, that's okay. I'm just I, I can remember, I, I understood that there were survivors. Yes, I heard there were some. And they made a show about that as well. There's Timeless. a movie about it too. Yeah. Timeless. And they go through all the, they're popping with a pod, going to the, all these significant events in gotcha. history. And they go in and then shift. And the first episode was about the Hindenburg. That's cool. Okay. I'll have to, I'll have to, I'll have to watch that. Yeah. But I don't um, know if you have, yeah. have you any thoughts about that, Erica. I'm silent. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't, the it wasn't the 1930s, so I don't expect it's not like something that. Yeah, I don't. I don't know too much. My son mentioned it the other day, but you know, okay. he's way smarter than me sometimes. Well, in in my old timeline, there were no survivors. Everyone oh. died. It was like that's why that was the big thing. Like you know, the news reporter that was filming it there. That's the other thing too. The Hindenburg had so many flights, and isn't it interesting that this is one that they actually filmed. So cameras were rolling. They were able to see the Hindenburg ignite. Right. And that led to even more, because when you could visually see an airship catch on fire, because hydrogen is flammable, helium is not. 
But that's another story. And there's a reason why the Germans used hydrogen instead of helium, because the United States had the only helium um, facility and they decided not to sell to the Germans. So the Germans instead used hydrogen gas, which if not, you know, is flammable basically. If it was he helium extinguishes fire. So can you imagine like at a birthday party, if the, if the kid, the candle hits the thing, a balloon and it ignites, it doesn't. It, the, the helium actually extinguishes fire. So, so that was the other part of it. Cameras were rolling, captured the event. For myself, it's a big Mandela effect because I remember there were no survivors and the, and the person filming it was like, oh, the humanity. Bah. Um, but now it's, I, I've seen through the timelines, it's been tinkered with. So now there's like almost 70 survivors. So it's almost like the time travelers kept like changing things so that more and more people wouldn't have died, which leads to more people on the timeline. People that were taken off the timeline in the past from what I read, my old timeline, they're back on the timeline. They've had children and their children have had children. They could have great grandchildren at this point. So yeah, so there's a lot involved when it comes to just airships, people's mentality, where, I mean, it's been almost a hundred years, but we're still afraid of them, right? People are like the Hindenburg. Ah, so as soon as that mentality can flip, so that people understand that they're safe, I think that's going to change everything. Not just for moving cargo, but also for travel, getting to remote places in the Amazon or where there's no roads available to get to now. Now that's that's not a problem anymore. So, and there's also the concept of what they call picnics. So let's say you want to. So with an airship, you know, you always want to be, be making money to go back and forth. So let's say that you're in Toronto and you want to go visit one of the Northern Territories and like go to one of the tribes or something. And there's a ship carrying cargo. You can actually go on there. And as, as a picnic, you take like a four hour ride up north. You get off, you meet with the locals, you have local food. They call it a picnic while they're unloading the cargo and then putting new cargo on. Let's say it's a mining facility and there's uh, some kind of mining products they want to put on the ship. A lot of these ships can carry a, usually about 100 tons of product, which is about four or five tractor trailers worth. And then everyone comes back. So at the end of the day, you're back in Toronto. You had an adventure. You know, you were with, you were like with the ship carrying the cargo. And then the cargo got delivered. So that's like a win for everyone. It's like a little adventure. So there's all different ways and creative things you could think of to make all of this make, make sense. I was thinking it's interesting that it was filmed like 9-11, like Challenger, like any, any time when you want to end something <laughs> or create, you know, create a change in how we function or operate. There's this huge witnessing. I just think it's interesting that it was caught on film like Challenger. Challenger, all the kids were put into the classroom and the TVs were rolled out. And it's like, this is the one time where everybody is watching and so they said, no more space travel, no more, no more balloons, right? <laughs> yeah. And have you ever heard what I'd say about the, with the, the Challenger disaster with the, um, the doppelgangers? Have you heard about that? I've seen them. Okay. Even the names, like one lady, it seems like she uses her middle name as her first name now. And yeah. So you want me to explain like how I see that from the Akashic Records? I love you explaining everything in your brain. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Go for it. I'll, I'll try to do this. Okay. I see. Yes. Yeah. So, so basically, um, Challenger, you know, a minute or so into liftoff, it explodes. So, and then, you know, everyone on board dies. Meanwhile, 20 years later, people start finding photographs of people that look exactly the same and even have the same name or identical name or, or, or slightly off a little bit. Maybe they're- Or I'm kid. your brother. I'm his brother. Or I'm, I'm his brother. Or, Twin. Their, yeah. or their birthday is off by one day. You know, yeah. How, how could that be? So what a lot of people say was like, oh, that's NASA, you know, never a straight answer. They're being mm. deceptive. But is that really what happens? So when you look at the Akashic Records, you see something different. And you see, you begin to understand how timelines operate. So basically what happened is that there, what, when I read into it, four of those astronauts are what are called founders. So I don't know if you know, like when I talk about player characters, there's mm -hmm. normal player characters. There are the founders 
uh, I also call them the dragons, but basically they're the creators of different realms and so forth. They have like like high, higher authority. Um, and there's another kind called pay, pay to play, but that's, an, that's another story. Uh, and then there's the non-player characters. So about four of these astronauts were founders and when they were not supposed to be taken off the timeline. On, the, on our timeline, they were not supposed to have been killed. So when that happened, Earth authorized them to be brought back onto the timeline, onto our timeline from another timeline. So it's like that movie, Everything Everywhere All at Once, where the, yeah. the, the Chinese woman owns the laundromat and then she discovers that she has all these other lives and one life, she's a chef, another life, she's a famous actress, martial artist and blah, blah, blah. So Earth authorizes these other versions of these people to be brought back onto the timeline because it made the timeline literally millions of times better to have these founders on the timeline. So they're brought, they're brought back in and when you look at their history, like uh, one of the women who lives near me, um, she is, she's always been like in, she's a professor at Yale. Really? And she's always been like, a, you know, involved in law. And you can see like, you know, in the 70s and 80s, she went to law school and there's the whole history. And she looks exactly like the, the one of the women that was killed, just older. People have analyzed her voice and the voice is almost identical. Uh, facial like ticks and so forth are like almost identical. So how could this be? So our, is this possibility of timelines, could this actually be true where there are, are different versions of us on different timelines that have made different life decisions? And maybe in one timeline, our mom had us a day later than on another timeline. And maybe in another timeline, our middle name was something instead of something else. So it's something for people to think about, but I believe it starts to give us a big clue as to how this reality actually works with timelines, deja vu, you know, dreaming, and, and all these all, all these other types of things that will begin to give us power over the reality that the global narrative keeps trying to take away and keeps trying to force us. Don't think about these things, humans. Instead, worry about this and worry about that. But when, when, when all these things start to click in our mind, like, wow, I wonder if that's true. So ju I'm just giving you information. Everyone can make their own decisions about like what makes sense and so forth. But when you start to get more information, like, I never thought of it that way. Could that actually be true? It begins to expand our consciousness and make us think in directions where we would have never thought of before. That would have seemed like that silly sci-fi fantasy movie, blah, I saw that in a movie. So, you know, it's make pretend. Like, no, because the system has to tell you what's going on. So there's so much soft disclosure in movies. And I think a lot of what we see and hear about and learn about is either the truth or it's a distortion of the truth, but there's some amount of truth to it. So, and then we know what resonates with us. Like if we hear something and it makes sense, it's like, that makes sense. Like never thought of it that way, but could be possible. So ch challenging our minds, I think is always a good thing. I like it because when I, whenever I talk to you, I'm just going to tell you that what you just need is very palatable. It's, it's easy to absorb. And what I think happens for us sometimes, a person like me might see that. I see the pictures of the two women of basically all of them, except for maybe one that, that there you see an alternate life. And you just feel cheated, angry, upset, hurt, confused because you feel like a, a joke has been played on you. And, you know, you feel like it's a huge conspiracy. Look what they did to us. And, you know, so there's this answer that only leads you to frustration because you feel cheated in some way where I have to say the theories that you have are just so advanced and so different of a of a perspective that it just it just opens more doors for you know for possibilities in thinking rather than it's just a scam or you know you know what i'm saying terry it's just yeah absolutely the characters have reset buttons 
I guess it's like here it is this interactive game where we're in this game together and it's this interactive reality but Terry might have a reset button and I don't know if I don't understand that Terry has a reset button then now I'm arguing with Terry that no you lied to me yesterday or you you whatever this is you know that that I'm not I'm not accepting of this answer even for myself and then I'll, I'll let you say this, Terry, because I would get in arguments with people at work and I swear I would do one thing and then someone would say, you did this. And I said, no, I did not. And I'm having an argument like I did not say that. I have never said that and I have never done that. And I was entering these situations where people are saying that I did things and I did not do. My sister has memories and she says, I remember the time. And I said, I have no clue what you're talking about. I said, that might be me number 37. And you're talking to me number 64. I have no idea what you're talking about because I don't know. <laughs> There's things I have no memory of that people tell me. People who even friend me and they say, I remember working with you and it was, and I have no clue. Even they, they can tell me their name. They can show me their picture. I have no recollection of this person's existence, but the, I was this great person to them. And they're telling me all these things I did and I have no idea what they're talking about. I, I just tell you, I had an experience that I knew that I shifted timelines. And I was with a, a group of people and we were on a houseboat uh, on Lake of the Woods. And all of a sudden we moved through something and I could feel a shift. And when it happened, I had the realization, oh my God, I just changed timelines. And it was, it was so profound for me because I think we have these things that we do it, but we may not, we may not be aware of it. But at that particular time, I was on the middle of a lake and I, I, I could just, there was just total sense of a shift. The people were the same, everything was the same, but I knew that I had shifted into a different timeline. That's cool. Yeah, it, it, it was a really cool experience. Actually, actually um, on Friday at that X, that X flare, the 2.2. Yeah. I, I had an a, a, a awareness of that as well as, and actually seeing the ripple effect between um, certain situations with uh, a person I'm talking to and how 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 charged it was and then also from uh, another experience of of some family members that were having some uh, a very charged uh, interaction as well and it's things about that were that are very they they can impact on your on a, on your life on the way you're going to go through into the next timeline or into a timeline and so then then I was talking to you last night you start talking to the other person on Friday so it's like things that really are expanding us into the whole another venture of of the love or shifting to our next chapter I kind of felt like I was just seeing that kind of ripple on Friday I don't know if you had any experiences with that whole flare on uh on friday this also makes me think like is, is it also changing your emotional density like where you're you're completely enthusiastic and excited and then you're like huh i don't think that really matters like you 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 like completely change focus and you completely change all your, your thinking completely changed like i've i've had a situation where i was i could literally feel myself shifting in all the things that I thought was important that day and my emotions to just kind of just sitting there and observing it and and it's like oh well that's gone now like all those <laughs> whatever <laughs> all these feelings and thoughts that I had inside me are like true and so then I could totally see it where someone the next day and be like you're a different person than you were yesterday what happened wow Yes. So our, D our DNA, <clears throat> it has a crystalline structure. So when we get this solar radiation, whether it's from an X 2.2 or an M 4.4 or what, what, even the, 
oh, it's not earth directing, don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. We're still getting the usually the ultraviolet radiation from it. It feels like we are having something happen to our DNA. Like, is it possible that this radiation is actually data that's incoming, that's expanding our DNA? And for some people, it doesn't feel good. Like I know people, they go, they call it ascension symptoms. They'll suddenly get a bad backache or parts like I didn't do anything, but all of a sudden my leg hurts or my hip hurts or, you know, you know, whatever the, whatever the case is. And then a lot of people get like sudden anger. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff that's releasing from our DNA, like ancestral trauma. So people should be aware of that as well. And just like, let that stuff, let that stuff get out, but it's all part of us cleaning up so that we can get to like another higher level of well, what it's called going from the 666, which is six electrons, six neutrons, and six protons, which is the basis of carbon, to 616, which is um, the basis of like a higher crystalline structure. And I find it interesting, like even in the Marvel, Marvel comic world and so forth, there's the 666 version of Earth, and then there's the more highly advanced 616 version of Earth. So I, I feel like there's a like a little bit of soft disclosure going on with that as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the sun is 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 codes, it's data, and our bodies are receiving it. And some people can't deal with it. It's like too much for them. And maybe they won't be able to like go, maybe they they won't be able to go to a higher timeline. You know, our we all have our own where we are and you know what we're trying to accomplish and like why we came into I call it the earth game. Why did we come into the earth game? right? Like, is this a game? Is this an adventure? Like, uh, how do we how do we face all the all the things that we're learning about? Is this one of the grandest adventures of discovery ever? Or do we look at it like, in a negative way? But if all these things that I talk about and other people, I'm not the only one that talks about it, other people talk about this as well. This, this is like, wow, this is like the lifetime we've been waiting for. And like Erica says, like, am I Erica 64 or am I version, you know, what version of Erica did you deal with, right? I believe that's literally, literally true. Like the way I see it, almost like a Groundhog Day. Um, if I scale it, if you can believe it, I believe it's possible that we've lived 300 versions of this life, probably a little bit more. And that's why we get deja vu, because we remember things from other versions but as we keep, you know, ascending to the next level, like maybe version number 10 of Erica wasn't so great, but version number 300, she's limitless. All of her psychic abilities are turned on, complete health, abundance. All these animals want to be around her because radiating such a beautiful glow. So to me, it's like, it's all about like getting, like keep ascending, keep ascending, keep ascending, doing, doing these things so that we actually can get to these higher levels. And then people will like, people will literally drop out of our lives too, because the other part of it is, is that if we start vibrating at a higher frequency and someone is at a lower frequency, it's just not, it's not natural for them to be around us. Like they don't want to be around us because we're at a different frequency level. But then the good part is we'll start attracting other people that are at the same frequency we're at, sometimes even a higher frequency. It's all about like helping each other, running the frequencies through our body and, and keep getting better and better and better and better. And that's what's happening to the world right now. People are talking to their kids about this as well, because this is, oh, we were we were out the other day with my son and I was kind of explaining to him, we were observing some people outside and, and I was explaining to him like, as we walked into the room, people, are sensing us as we walk into the room because you're comfortable and you're at peace and you're at a certain vibration. And as you walk into the room, you can see other people begin to act. Certain people were acting skittish and needing attention and becoming outwardly. And I said, if if this was a school environment, these were be kids that are uncomfortable with where you are and your vibration and they would begin to attack you. It's just by nature, they would sense the energy that you have, be threatened by it. And because you didn't, because you weren't attracted 
and we're seeing attracted like density and electric impulse that you weren't in their world, they would attack you. Like people aren't really understanding, like this is kind of what's going on with bullying is that I sense something different in you and I have to destroy it type thing. I don't know if this makes sense because I kind of went off, but it was just like, yeah, no. like, like you were saying, people are sensing like, I, I don't, it, kind of like when the zombies see the person and they're like, no, that's <laughs> and they're like, ah, and like yeah, they begin to chase you. You moved around and you tried to be as slow as you could, but you couldn't because they can smell you, right? They can smell that there's something different. Or, and you don't even have to say anything. You can dress the same, you can look the same, but they can tell mm, something. Or, or they literally excommunicate you. They just don't want you to be in their life. And that's part of too, like when someone's in, in a religion and they get excommunicated, it could it be that like your frequency has risen to a certain level that they just don't want you a part of their group anymore. You're not, you're not down at that frequency like they were, um, like you had been before. So a lot of different ways to look at it. Yeah. Literally, yeah, I, I think I was told that before, like, why are people threatened by you? Like why? <laughs> so there, well, and, and you know what? You get to a point where you say, "What's wrong with me?" And you realize, well, maybe because I'm not, I don't, I don't vibe at the same vibes anymore as they do, and so they can't. They're uncomfortable with it. You're they lucky. don't know. They don't know how yeah. to react anymore. You're lucky because now we we understand these words and we have this language that we speak and and these explanations, but before we didn't know, and. It's so funny because this is the big answer of why we can't go through the maze and get the cheese like everyone else. Yeah, because our scripts have changed. Because like the other way I look at it too is that, well, Shakespeare said all the world's a stage. So like another, another way of looking at what's going on in this reality is that we're being observed. We're players on a stage. We're playing our role. Our script name is our birth name. <clears throat> and um, could it be that as soon as we start to raise our frequency and we're not on the same script, so to speak, as another le le level of the, the NPCs or even player characters, we just don't, yeah, we just don't vibe with them. They don't know how to respond to us. They literally can just turn, turn around and walk away because they, they're like, they're not following the script. What do we do? So there's that whole level. And then what's following the script? And then what do I have a version of myself on a lower level right now that's running a script for that, but my consciousness has ascended to a higher level. So there's like all kinds of like really cool ways to like look at the reality and see, begin to begin to see what's under, you know, what could be happening as far as like scripts and players and being on a stage and like, could that whole aspect have some amount of truth to it? How so much I, oh, I have one question. What tell me about uh, or you called them the, the founders, right? So how would how do you, so if we were to look at around us, how would we be able to pick out founders? Are we founders? Um Are, you know, like it's curious. Just a uh, do just you want a, do you do you want me to check? Sure. Okay. Oh I love it. I love it when we do stuff. <laughs> okay. So so there's there's different level. I'm getting a yes on all three of you. There there's different levels of founders. There's um, almost like if you worked at a, a game design company, like I'm a found. I can create worlds, or I can create galaxies, oh, yeah. or I'm a founder. Of, like I oversee the creation of universes. So there's different ways you can scale what the founders are, and you are you are all at the very least creators of worlds is what I'm getting so and then if I read further into it I could be like okay give me an example of a constellation that Jonathan was involved with and does he have a certain is there a certain star cluster that you're more involved with than another star cluster and the same thing with Terry and the same thing with Erica so you can you can keep going with that and actually when I when I do sessions for people um that's one of the things that I start to look into. I see what the Akashic records want me to reveal because you don't want to give out too much information. You don't, you don't want people's ego to get too big or you don't want, 
there's basically your higher self knows how much what the right information for for you is at the right time and um you know reading into what your secret gifts are because a lot of us have secret gifts that we don't even know that we have um like presents that were left for us under the christmas tree that we never opened up and then once you understand that that could be a gift is it possible you can get access to that gift and there's there's a lot i've been doing sessions with people lately people have got some pretty incredible gifts that they had no idea that they had um and some of them have kind of smuggled them in through the tsa of the earth so to speak so you go through like let, let's say there's the concept of the archons before you're allowed to come onto the planet you know you've got their soul contracts and there's all this other stuff going on which is a whole other discussion like can you smuggle in some of your gifts and smuggle in some certain types of things they usually find a lot of these things and confiscate them before you get here but for the most part and in the dream world correct the dream world the astral world yeah so there's that those are whole other topics as well so what about people who some people can create simulations right they can is that completely different from founders what do you mean uh create a simulation oh so, so here it is uh, me terry and jonathan are together in this in our reality but i can uh, i can create an illusion or a reality in our group because we're in together all the time and so i can take oh the so initiative to say this is really what i can paint the world for them yes and now this is jonathan's world because i influence yes. his reality so strongly yes. was that different from what you're saying as a founder so yeah so i think that's for all all player characters we all have our bubble of reality mm -hmm. and we exist in time and space and quantum physicists are now discovering that qu time and space doesn't actually exist it's almost like you put on your vr your vr headset is time and space you take off your vr headset and you're like holy shit i just thought i was living this life on earth like what the hell so we have our bubbles of reality and they intersect and we co-create our dream together so when when we are when we're dreaming with other people we can actually influence their reality they can influence our reality we can exchange data as to how this reality works everyone that's watching this show right now we are all co-creating our reality together at this time and i like it because every time i get with you it's like downloading some new information like oh if i know i can do that it's then i can do this like yay <laughs> so that that's different then there's like what's called a matrix buster are you familiar with that term too? Um, a matrix buster. Tell me what you, how you, how would you define oh, what it? What I believe it is, is that like we're here and we're being fed a certain simulation, but we can actually make a dent in it. I guess like Neo, like you can damage it. You can take it apart and you can help people get out of this matrix. Yeah. So I call that a reality, reality reality translator technology Basically, you can actually see what the reality actually is so sometimes if i look up it when my third eye is activated look at clouds i see like geometric symbols like that's not really a puff of wis wispy air that's a starship or those are just geometric symbols like flowing mm -hmm. through the sky. Yeah. so yeah when we all get our reality translators turned on like neo did you begin to see through that and begin to actually influence the reality be able to yeah, I guess bust the matrix, so to, so to speak. And we don't, I don't know if we, we want to actually bust the matrix. There's like, when you look at the, the matrix that we're in, there's like, if we didn't have the matrix, we wouldn't be existing right now. But there, then there's the concept of the inverted matrix. So yeah. and how the retina in our eye flips the image. Um, there are different type of, con you know, why does the retina in our eye flip, flip the image to be a certain way? Um, so being able to like free ourselves so that what we might consider to be a prison now it's a playground it was supposed to be a playground it was supposed to be a school it was supposed to be all these other beautiful things but it got taken over so you know so being able to see through what the reality is i think is very important for for all of us in the future 
I like that because I, I didn't feel like we were supposed to leave. I feel like we're supposed to identify and use it to our advantage. You use the matrix against the matrix. It's not, you're not here to destroy it, but to use it, you know, make it what you want it. It's part of the game. Yeah, it's part of the yeah, earth a new version uh-huh. of it. Yeah. yeah. Leave in the game and i think people want to get out of the game and they want to destroy the game they want to end the game all fast i'm like i still got a roll of quarters back here and i'm still trying to win the game <laughs> yeah exactly like i really want to win like so i'm i'm not trying to like bust up the money system i might want to change things in the system but i don't want to destroy it so i'm not i'm not trying to leave i'm not trying to get saved i'm actually trying to win inside of it cuz i feel like as we win that we can teach other people you're Neo. You're showing everybody else, like, guess what? You don't have to follow the code. Here's the cheat sheet. Bing, bing, bing. Here's the secret box. You can punch the yeah. secret box and you can get all the coins you want. Like, you can win. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I have an optimistic view of it, of the game. Exactly. We, we already won. We're just going back to find out how we won. I've heard that concept, too. Yeah. Yeah. I want, I want a high score. <laughs> <laughs> I want the high score. Sure. How much of this would you say it's like, okay, so we went we went beyond it because I was gonna ask about the Truman show since we were oh yeah observing we're trying inside to cut the out, game. Trying to cut out that dense phantom aspect of the matrix of that system, right? What if Truman knew he was on the show and instead of going through the door, he was like, ha, I'm about to show you something. Yeah. <laughs> Wait till I go to work tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going to change my paycheck. I'm going to get me a new wife. (laughs) You know, like he could have really had fun with them because once he knows that you're inside this bubble, let's, let's have some fun with that. Right. Let's have some fun with it. Anyway, well, that was wonderful. I don't know if you guys had any other conversation, any kind of questions. Well, this is gold. I mean, it was, (laughs) because we still came right back to the original why we can't get the cheese the same way everybody else does. So when you got that awkward feeling, but man, this is great. So tell us what, what kind of services are you providing for people again and how they can find you? This is. Yeah. So um, I don't, I don't really do a lot of sessions. I might do like one, one a week and my February already got filled. I'm going to try to make some available for, for March. Um, I'm more involved in like these business ideas that I have, like with both my main company involved in food distribution and also airships of the future. And um, I love making video, like quantum businessman videos. I'm I'm working on um, act eight of the symphony of realities video, which I'm calling dream on. Um, That's probably going to be it. The video is at least an hour, but I go into all these different subjects that, are, are kind of a little, little bit crazy, but I feel it's all good for consciousness expansion. Um, Mandela, more Mandela effects and just the way the reality works. So doing that and yeah, so my my plate is definitely, definitely full for at least this year, for sure. Oh my God, any exciting trips? You should, I'm telling you, can take us on expeditions. I'm telling you, take me to Alaska or something. Mm-hmm. I well, want to go on one of your picnics in the airships. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. 100%. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. Wouldn't that be a cool thing? Yeah, let's have a rendezvous. Yeah. There is there is a trip that I put it on my website. Um, if you go into the travel section, inviting just, it's not going to be a lot of people, probably definitely less than 20, probably maybe around 10, but it's to Ireland to go to a soul shard library and activate it so this is like a really like cool is that with the doctor the female doctor lady who was here for convention or oh she might she might go she might go okay so sorry yeah like everyone that's going hasn't like been confirmed yet we're still trying to like figure out how many people are to go do we get an airbnb like where do we stay because it's not just going to be to the soul shard library but it's also going to be different places of power within Ireland that we're going to visit. And we're going to rate them based upon what places we should go that'll have the most impact for who's in the group. But the whole concept of the Soul Shard Shard Library is on this island 
off the coast of Ireland called Inishmore. And the way this, the way this works is that many of us at the time of Atlantis, when it was having its third fall, we knew that it was going to fall. So what we did is we took um, important soul shards that we had and deposited them in this library. So you might say, well, what, what's a soul shard? You know, that doesn't make any sense. So a soul shard is um, an aspect of, our, of a past life where we've accomplished something amazing. So let's say we were able to perfect our reality translator skills. So we put that into a soul shard and put it into safekeeping at the Inishmar, Inishmore Soul Shard Library, which doesn't look like a library. It looks like a giant cliff is basically the best way to describe it. But in the unseen, in a higher frequency, it's a library that certain of us know how to gain access to, but it's being suppressed by a wormhole next to it. Mm. And you could actually like look up the wormhole on Inishmore Island, and it's this rectangular block that's cut into the stone. And people actually do cliff diving into it. I was watching a Red Bull. I was thinking about that. Yeah. So literally they, was thinking about it. Yeah, they call it, they call it the um they call it the wormhole. So it's actually a wormhole that's been suppressed mm. in the library. So we're going to do work on that, um, access the library, open it up so that even if you don't go with the group, there'll, there'll be a way for you to still get access to your soul shards. That's going to change timelines like in a, in a big way when people become aware that that's something they can get back. Like, oh, I, for safe deposit, my safe deposit box, I had these skills. I would love to get those back. So that, that's an example of the type of stuff that, um, planning for the future. So if all that works out, it's going to happen this summer. So. Dang it. I'm going back to Egypt in June. Are you? Okay. Yeah. I'm going to find you. <laughs> you got me. I'm so excited now that you said that. I had a headache when we started. It just, it went away. Like as soon as you hit the 616 and the Marvel code, and oh, really? shifting like my my headache was just like zipping zipping up mm. pulling out i feel so good now it wasn't quite a normal headache huh ah! mm. <laughs> yeah okay well that's great so we know the yeah. travel section and um and you got great shows coming up that's really exciting to know that you got the actual remote traveler from staring at goats Oh yeah, Lynn Buchanan. Yeah. Definitely gotta watch that. Yeah, very, very interesting. Lynn Buchanan. Wow. And uh I know you're super busy and I appreciate your time and your personality and your love and your light. I just think you're so amazing. Yeah, no, I love I love talking to you guys. You guys are amazing. Thank you. Yeah, and we don't fight you to tell you like that's crazy. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Have you exactly. ever had anybody like just completely disregard any of your um your hypothesis? You know, I had um one of the programmers that worked for me. We, I used to have this thing called Mandela Mondays. So I'd have a staff meeting on every Monday and I would talk about a Mandela effect. <laughs> and I didn't realize it, but I was driving one of these guys, like I was putting him in fear. <laughs> I was literally putting him in fear. And the what the Mandela effect that got him was the one about Richard Simmons. Remember Richard Simmons, the exercise? Yeah. Yeah. Like a pony, like a pony. In, in this timeline, he never wore a headband. Like, and I remember like all of his sweat into the oldies. He always had, he always, oh, always. He, he had a yeah. big forehead. So like he needed a headband to cover that big forehead. Yeah. And, and this, that big hair. Yeah, yeah, and the big hair, right? Yeah. And his like ultra tight shorts and all that. Um, in this timeline, he never wore, wear, wears a headband. And he's like, Chris, I know that guy wore a headband. I know. And, and he was like completely like, he wound up leaving the company. Whoa. Yeah. He's like, he didn't know what to do with the information. So that's what, that's what happened. So I also learned an important lesson to be careful about, you know, waking people up, unplugging them from the, from the matrix, like Morpheus told Nemo, like you, you can't just unplug them from the matrix. They're not ready for it. So when someone's ready for it and they 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 hit their wake up date, then they'll then they'll seek out the information. Before then, you're just kind of giving out information that's going to put people in fear. I get it because it's like if you found out that your house doesn't have a foundation and there's a big hole underneath it, you know that for them they they don't know when their home is going to collapse. 
Right. It's very, it's very uncomfortable to know that, you know, that's, exactly. that's yeah, that's how I felt about um, spontaneous combustion. Yeah. <laughs> Like, ah! yeah, right. That's you another, can't live with the spontaneous combustion, y'all. It's very stressful to yeah. know that that exists. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. They need the foundation. I guess that's why a lot of people they they hold on to very firmly to religion and very firmly to the status quo of you know how they go about their day, living from birthday to Christmas to holidays, and they have to have that 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 firm schedule to, to hold on to, so. Exactly. But I appreciate you. Terry, anything? No, just uh, amazing. It's just like, just the, the thoughts are just like, woo. <laughs> I know. Jonathan? Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Thank you very much. And I mean, just a lot of uh, golden information and, and uh, with some of the founder thing and it just, you know, with some of the life experiences, just kind of makes it makes sense on why things get we get focused on a certain way. And yeah, because we are the busters, essentially, right? So exactly. That's how people get frustrated with us because like, why won't you just do what I told you to do? Meh. Mm -hmm. Meh. Nah, I don't have to do it that way. I can do like, it. Different. You know everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, well, did people used to tell you you were a know it all too, Chris? That I was a know-it-all? What? Did people ever used to tell you, you're a know-it-all? No, well, they would say that in a nice way. Like, even before I wake up, they're like, Chris, you're like an encyclopedia. Like, I don't need Google. I just need, I'll talk to you and I talk. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, they, that means they liked you then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To some, yeah, to some extent. Yeah. To some extent, yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. This is so wonderful. I'm going to put his information down in the um, in the description, just remember to like, subscribe, and share this information. People need to know about these non-players and these founders and all the things that we talked about. These are wonderful concepts, new, new, new to me. So I had a great time. I totally enjoy it. And I thank you so much. You're Thanks. very welcome. And remember where we're going, we don't need roads. <laughs> <laughs>